Hey guys, welcome to another low production video. In fact, this is so low production this week. I'm in writing mode, and so I'm not very presentable. I haven't shaved, not very dressed up, but I got some good ideas for you. Because what I want to talk about is actually a book that I'm in the process of um, doing the edits on that will come out next January. And the book is called The Law of Happiness. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to just take one little snippet of this and give you something to think about as you're looking at your own well-being and happiness. Now, here's the concept. Um, actually, it's not a concept, it's just a fact. Over the last probably, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten years or so, the field of psychology has made a little bit, I wouldn't call it a shift, I would say um, sort of an addition into some emphasis in a new frontier. It all started um, back when the president of the APA, a guy named Martin Seligman, said that psychology has been too negative for a hundred years, you know, depressions and anxieties and addictions and all that. Let's go do something positive. So what they said was, why don't we start studying the field of, this is what they called it, positive psychology, which really was a study of well-being and wellness and health and success and, you know, people's strengths and virtues and a bunch of other stuff that all of us obviously care about. Now here's what got really interesting, and this is just the first snippet that I want to talk about today, because it applies to all of us. What has happened is, over those years, there has been an enormous body of research that's emerged, and I mean gazillions of studies, like major universities have, have graduate degrees in positive psychology and all this stuff, there's just studies going on everywhere. And in that research, there have been some very robust findings. And what robust means from a, a research perspective is, you know, we can count on this stuff. There are actually statistically significant realities. And here is one of the big findings. Now, are you ready for this? 10%. Let's start over. Where do you think your happiness comes from? I just want you to kind of sit with that question for a moment. In fact, you can even hit pause. Or said another way, if you're not that happy right now, what do you think would make you happy? Now, apart from if you're clinically depressed or something like that, I'm just talking about sort of how fulfilled in life you are. What do you think would make you happy? Would it be finding the right person if you're single? Would it be um, making your marriage work if it isn't working now? Would it be more money? Would it be a different job? What would it be that would finally kind of do it? All right, think about that. Now, after you thought about that, Here's what the actual research says. You ready for this? Amazing. 10% of your happiness comes from virtually anything circumstantial. And what that means is that factors like if you made more money or, you know, if you're rich or poor, wealthy or, you know, not so wealthy, as long as your kind of basic needs and security are taken care of, the research shows it doesn't make that big a difference. And actually, if you did win the lottery or whatever, you'd get a 10% bump, and then you would come down to there's kind of like this set point, sort of like a thermostat. You know, we get happy for a while. If you get that new car, for example, you know, you're on the top of the moon. On the top of the moon, is that the same? On the top of the world. There you go. I don't know. You, you feel better, right? But you notice after a while the new car smell goes away and whatever, you get used to it. That's what it, it means by you go back to this set point. Or you get that job that's going to make you happy or that, that, that house. If only I could live there. Well, those things are going to give you a little bump, but you go back to a set point. And here's what's interesting. This is the stuff that most people are, are striving for. You know, if I got the job I wanted, the person I wanted, or the, the money that I wanted, or could live where I wanted, or, 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 or. You know what the research shows? It's not what it really does it. It'll give you a bump. These are great things. You know, my dad used to say, son, money will never buy you happiness, but it will buy you a big red Cadillac to go look for it in. Well, that's kind of the 10%. All right, now past that, there's another around 50% or so that comes from, and I'm just going to throw a word at this, what I refer to as your constitutional makeup. In other words, your basic temperament, you go into a nursery and look at babies, some of them are kind of, you know, sort of happy with the world and others are like, eh, eh. you know, they're sort of like, you know, the future attorneys. <laughs> Just kidding for all you lawyers. But you can tell some people are more happy than others, kind of 
their basic temperament. And then other things probably happen early in life and developmentally and biochemically and all this stuff. And this stuff is pretty real. And there are things that, you know, we can do to, to help that. But there's some sort of makeup constitutionally, biologically, that you bring to the table. Then, this is where it gets really interesting, the other 40% or so, basically, A, is under your control. See, a lot of times, I don't know, good things happen, bad things happen. We can control some of this, not all of it. This stuff's pretty much what we're wired with. But this stuff, you can really control. I mean, you have something to say about this. And what they find is this huge area of variance that can take people from here to kind of like well-being is not only under your control, but it's a collection of basically what I'm going to call life practices, which consists of your thinking patterns, your relationships, how you look at certain kinds of spiritual realities, things like gratitude and forgiveness, and a whole bunch of stuff, which actually you know, I'm going to talk about in the book. But they find that no matter where people are rich or poor or whatever, that there are some life practices, thinking patterns, ways you process your feelings, ways you order relationships, whether you're goal-oriented or not, how much you invest yourself in the, the actual proactive creating a life for yourself, how much you invest yourself in a calling versus just kind of like going through the day. There's a whole list of these which I'll give you on further love production videos. But the point is this. I want you to just think about how much are you investing in some things like, you know, money or fame or, you know, whatever that thing is, you know, that object, materialism, whatever, that you think is going to do it. The research says it's not going to do it. I mean, you can go find that thing and it'll, you know, it's great. It's not going to do it. This stuff, you know, we have things we can do for some of this, but how much of it are you focusing on working on your life? Because the reality is, if you're working on your life, and I'm going to talk about what a bunch of those are in upcoming videos, if you're working on your life, you can find sustainable well-being. Now again, I understand there's clinical issues and depressions and all that that, that we need treatment for, but what I'm talking about are lifestyles of deep community and goal orientation and using your strengths and forgiveness and gratitude and a bunch of stuff. These spiritual realities are basically where our well-being comes from. So stop looking outside, start looking inside, and to one another in your spiritual life development, and you can find more well-being and happiness than probably you ever thought possible. Okay? Send me your um, comments, and um, I'll see you next time.